So before we talk about uniform circular motion, let's recall how objects move along one dimension and along two dimensions. So let's suppose we have the following box that is resting on a horizontal surface. And let's suppose we apply net force on the box that points in the positive direction along our x-axis. So our object will begin to accelerate in the same direction as the net force. And in fact, the velocity vector and the acceleration vector of that box will point in the same exact direction. So once again, that box will move in a straight line along our x-axis whenever a net force acts on our box. That means that the velocity and acceleration vectors will point in the same exact direction. So this is objects moving in one dimension along one axis. What about objects moving in projectile motion? So if an object is undergoing two-dimensional projectile motion, let's suppose the object follows the following parabolic pathway, notice that our net force now does not act in the same direction as motion. Now our net force acts perpendicularly to our ground while our motion continually changes. So the motion is in the same direction as velocity. For example, if we choose the highest point on our pathway, at the highest point, the velocity vector will point parallel to our ground while our acceleration vector and our force, our net force vector, will point perpendicularly to our ground. So, an object undergoing projectile motion will have velocity and acceleration vectors that point in different directions. Now, this is not always true for objects in free fall. Sometimes, the net force does act in the same direction as the motion, as the velocity, as in the following example. Let's suppose I take my object and I release my object directly downward. So notice not only my net force acts downward, but my velocity and acceleration also act downward. They point downward because my object is moving downward and it's accelerating in the same direction. So when we have uh, motion in two dimensions, sometimes the net force and velocity point in the same direction, but that's not always true. Now for objects moving in one dimensions, that's pretty much always true. So, now let's talk about uniform circular motion. So, the word uniform simply means that our object has the same exact speed throughout the motion. So let's suppose I take a string, a massless string, and I attach it at one end to a ball. And then I center my string and I spin my ball. So I create the following circular pathway. Now, if I spin it with a uniform speed, that simply means the magnitude of my velocity, of the ball's velocity at any given point, will be exactly identical. So let's suppose my ball begins here, and then as my ball travels, let's say it ends up here. Now, the velocity vector at this point will always point at a direction that is tangent to the pathway at that point. So at this point, it points this way, and at this point, the, and at this point, my velocity points this way. So notice, even though the magnitude of my velocity, the speed remains the same, our direction of velocity changes. And that means because velocity is a vector and our direction changes, my velocity too must be changing. Now recall that acceleration is the rate of change in velocity. So because my velocity is changing, that means my acceleration is also changing. In other words, my object is in fact accelerating. So let's recall what the formula for acceleration is. So the formula of acceleration is equal to, we take the limit of the ratio shown here as our change in time approaches zero or we simply take the derivative of our velocity vector function with respect to time. So, once again, objects moving in circular, in uniform circular motion.
any object undergoing uniform circular motion has constant speed, but its velocity is changing because our direction of motion is changing. Since our object is accelerating, or since our object is changing its velocity, that means our object is in fact accelerating. But what exactly is the magnitude of acceleration of our object? Well, let's look at the following diagram. Let's try to derive what our magnitude of velocity is. So let's suppose we take the following object and let's choose our object to be a point object. So it's a point in space. So my point begins at this point, let's say at initial position 1, and it travels to the final position, let's call it 2. Now, my displacement from point 1 to point 2 is given by change in x. So, from my center of the circle to this point is my radius, and likewise, from this point to this point is also my radius. Now, notice, because my object is undergoing uniform motion, the magnitude of the velocity 1 at this point is the same as the magnitude of velocity 2 at this point. This represents my change in angle. Now, notice because this radius is exactly perpendicular to my velocity 1 and this radius is exactly perpendicular to my velocity 2, if I bring over this vector and connect it at the origin with this point at point 1 and then I connect uh, the tails or the heads of these two arrows, I get the following triangle. And this triangle is similar to this triangle. That means the ratio of sides is exactly the same. And in fact, this change in theta, this change in angle, is exactly the same as this change in angle. So we have similar triangles. Now, what this vector represents is it represents the change in my velocity. So the change in my velocity vector as we go from our initial point at point 1 to my final point at point 2. Now, let's examine what happens as my change in time approaches 0. So as change in time approaches 0, that means my velocity 2 vector begins approaching velocity 1 vector because the change in x gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So as this approaches 0, v2 approaches v1. So as we see here, v2 begins approaching v1. And eventually, when v2 becomes very, very close to 1, when our change in theta becomes very, very close to 0, this change in the v vector will begin to point towards the center of the circle. Now, look at our formula for instantaneous acceleration. Our direction of instantaneous acceleration points in the same exact direction as the change in velocity. And because changes in velocity begins pointing towards the center of the circle as my change in time approaches zero, that means Eventually, as we take the limit, as the change in time approaches zero, my instantaneous, uh, my instantaneous acceleration will also approach uh, the center of the circle. So that means at any given point, my, the acceleration of my object points directly towards the center of our circle. So once again, as the change in time approaches zero, my velocity at point two approaches velocity at point one. So the magnitude we already know is exactly the same. What this is saying is that as the change in time approaches zero, our directions begin coinciding. Eventually, as we take the limit, our directions are exactly equal, and at that point, the acceleration points directly towards the center of our circle. Now, let's suppose that we take change in time to be very, very, very small. As the change in time is very, very small, we can use the following two similar triangles. So we essentially take this side and divide it by the radius, and that is approximately equal to this side divided by the radius. 
So notice that we replace v1 with simply v because the magnitude of v1 is equal to the magnitude of v2. So let's say that the magnitude of both of these is equal to some value v, some vector v. So the change in x, this side divided by r, is approximately equal to this side divided by this side. So this comes from the fact that these two guys are similar triangles. So now let's rearrange this equation. Let's bring our velocity to this side, and we'll see why in just a moment. So we essentially find what the change in my velocity vector is when we choose a change in time that is very, very small, very close to zero. So let's take our acceleration equation. So our acceleration equation is equal to, so we take the limit of this ratio as our change in time approaches zero. And now what we can do is take this value and plug it into this value here. So instead of this, we plug this whole value here. So we get the following result. So we take out our velocity vector and the radius. So this is the radius shown here, and we are left with taking the limit of the following ratio, the change in displacement divided by change in time, as the time, change in time approaches zero. But what is the limit of this ratio? Well, the limit of this ratio is simply velocity. So that means we can replace this with velocity, and we get the following formula. So radial acceleration or centripetal acceleration is equal to velocity squared divided by radius. So the, the value, the magnitude of that radial acceleration depends on the velocity of the object as well as the radius of our circle. So if the velocity increases, our acceleration will also increase. If the, radi if the radius increases, our acceleration will decrease. Once again, an object undergoing uniform circular motion has an acceleration called the radial acceleration or centripetal acceleration, has an acceleration that points towards the center of the circle and has a magnitude equal to v squared, the velocity squared divided by the radius of that circle, r.